What's up guys and welcome back to Moaning. If you guys are new here, then what's up? My name's Erica. Hey yo, how you doing? For today's video, we're going to be giving you a summary of the second play of Aeschylus Zoristaya, and that is The Libation Bearers. Now before we can get into it, please do not forget to hit that subscribe button and the bell icon so that you know every single time I post in the future. Let's get into the play. So the second play, The Libation Bearers, actually starts several years after the end of the Agamemnon. So the Agamemnon ends, if you guys don't remember, I will keep you up to date, the Agamemnon ends with the chorus basically yelling at Aegisthus and Clytemnestra after Clytemnestra has killed her husband Agamemnon and his concubine Cassandra. The chorus yells after them saying, yeah, now you can play happy families and you guys are ruling the kingdom. However, one day Orestes will come back and he will avenge his father and he will kill both of you in return. And Clytemnestra and Aegisthus didn't reply to this, but that was sort of the last note that the chorus of elders in that play left us on. Well, fast forward to play number two, and the play opens, the scene is the tomb of Agamemnon, so it's right behind the palace, we can see the palace in the background, but the tomb opens up, and Orestes enters the stage. Orestes is the son of Agamemnon, he was sent away quite a while ago, and he, because he was at a distance, he didn't get to mourn his father. So when he enters this tomb now, many, many years after Agamemnon has been murdered, he shows up, and he's with his friend, actually, and his friend's name is this. We're gonna put this in the bottom of the screen. Now, the reason why I'm spelling it first is because I want to explain the three different pronunciations of this name that I have heard, and I've actually been taught by different teachers. Okay, so it's either Pylades, I literally had to write down these pronunciations to remind me. It's either Pylades or, okay, I wrote this one down, but it sounds exactly like the other ones, but it sounds more like Pilates. So it's like Pilates, Pilates, that's it. The fact I had to write it down that it sounds like Pilates. But this, so those are the three that I've actually heard professors and teachers say to me. I'm gonna be going with Pylades because that's the one that I have used the most. But if you're Greek, please let us know what the actual pronunciation of this name is. I presume it's going to be the Pilates one or the, or the Pilades one. I assume, I hope it's not the one that sounds like Pilates, but either way, let me know, write out phonetically um, so that all of us can learn and I will pin that comment uh, when it comes up. So Orestes and Pylades, they show up in the scene. I guess Pylades actually kind of sounds like I'm saying my ladies. That was totally unintentional. Anyways, back to the play. They enter the scene, they enter the tomb and Orestes immediately gets to his knees and he starts praying to Hermes. When he starts praying to Hermes, he basically explains why he didn't get a chance to uh, mourn his father, what's been going on, he just kind of updates us, and in the process of doing this prayer, he chops off two locks of his hair to leave on the altar. Okay, one is an offering to his father. As he's explaining this though, we then see from the corner of the stage that Electra, who is Orestes' sister, so Clytemnestra's daughter, Clytemnestra and Agamemnon's daughter, and a chorus of slave women are entering the stage. So when Orestes sees this, he turns to Pylades and he basically brings them around the back of the tomb of their father, well, like of Orestes's and Electra's father, not of Pylades' father, he's just a friend. So they go behind this tomb to hide and the slave women and Electra enter the scene. The chorus give us a little choral ode where they basically explain who they are, that they are these slave women, and they do it in this really dark and dingy and tragic kind of way, because obviously it is a tragedy, right? So they have to do everything in a very dark way. And Electra then, she says that she's going to be making an offering to her father in this moment. So she raises up her cup of sorrow, that's what she calls it, which if anybody is wondering, um, that is literally just a wine offer, like a, like a libation that she's supposed to pour out. And when she raises it up, actually, she starts praying to the gods, she does look at the chorus and says, what am I actually pouring out this libation to? <laughs> like, what am I supposed to say? Because we've just been sent to do this, so what am I supposed to say? And she starts off like listing off all of these options, being like, could it be this? Could it be this? Could I list it off to this? Could I say this thing? And the chorus finally say, you know what, when you pour out the libation, you should pour it out not only to your father, but also to the person who is going to avenge your father. The exact quote is something along the lines, because I didn't write it down, but it's something along the lines of like, the one who murders in return, which as we know is Orestes. So Electra says, okay, and she lifts up this prayer to Hermes and she does lay out this libation to exactly what the chorus has said. So she says, you know, this is to my father, but also to the person who's going to come back and is going to kill my mother and my mother's new boyfriend in return because Electra tells us she 
fucking hates them. Okay, she is a daddy's girl through and through. She obviously doesn't say daddy's girl, uh, but this is just what you guys need to know. She loves her father. And so the idea that somebody has killed him is just weighing at her so much. When she's praying for this killer to come and kill Aegisthus and to come and kill Clytemnestra, she finishes off the prayer by looking back at the slave woman and basically saying, I'm done now. Which means that then the chorus can then start saying a little choral ode, which is just saying exactly what Electra has said. So they just basically say exactly the same prayer that she's now just said to the gods. So they're almost just reinforcing it. And as they're saying this, Electra's on the ground near the altar, right? And she looks up slightly and she sees the locks of hair that Orestes has left, but she doesn't know Orestes has left the hair. And Electra does this really, in my opinion, weird thing. And she looks at the locks of hair and she goes, oh my God, this hair looks just like mine. Now, I understand this is an ancient play. Uh, and I understand that possibly to people in the audience, they would have been like, well, yeah, that makes sense. That's totally fine. We all have very similar hair. Now, as somebody that has two brothers, neither of whom have similar hair to me, this doesn't seem like a good way of identifying <laughs> that somebody could be related to you. Cause like my younger brother has really straight hair. I have curly hair. My older brother has like wavy hair in the middle. And so if I were to compare, I know you have no idea that it's actually naturally curly, but it is. But like, if I were to compare my natural hair with my brother's, you wouldn't even have the same color hair. Like my older brother's is lighter than mine. My younger brother's is like a, maybe actually nearly my shade now. It's slowly getting darker over the years. It's just a very odd thing to do that you look at the hair and you're like, weird, that looks just like my hair. But anyways, that's exactly what Electra does. <laughs> She's like, this is very bizarre. What a coinkadink. And this obviously goes further because this is mythology, this is a play, this is a tragedy. We have to expand our realm of imagination. And so looking past the hair, she sees footsteps and she's like, well, what's going on there? So Electra stands up and she puts one of her feet in one of the uh, footprints. And she puts her other one in the other footprint and she follows the footprints till eventually she ends up running into, quite literally, Orestes and Pylades. Now, the first response that Electra has is not, oh my God, you must be my brother. The first response is, this is wild. Again, obviously not a direct quote from the Greek. Remember that Orestes looks like a total stranger to her. So she is very much having a moment of like, I don't really know how to react right now because I just prayed that my brother would come and kill these people and you guys have just shown up and there was hair on the altar that just looked like mine. So what is going on? And Orestes, seeing that his sister is struggling with this, he does actually out himself. He's like, hello, I'm your brother. I'm Orestes. I am now home. To which Electra replies and is like, I don't know if I'm convinced by this because this is very bizarre still. So Orestes, <laughs> Orestes says to his sister, well, in order to convince you that I'm your brother, look at my hair. Isn't it very similar to yours? We have this unbelievable pressure on the hair of siblings that needs to be exactly similar to one another. But anyways, apparently this is enough for Electra and she looks at Orestes and she goes, good golly, you're right, you must be my brother. Our hair is identical. A note here for you guys is that a lot of this play is just conversation. So a lot of this I'm going to be summarizing and I'm actually not going to say a lot about the conversation because what it tends to be, especially in this moment, is really Electra saying, oh my goodness, it's so good you've come to avenge the family. Oresti saying, I know, aren't I amazing? And the chorus leader saying, you have made us believe that everything is gonna be fine, basically, right? So that's what that happened over and over and over again in different ways. That's essentially what's going on in this play, uh, in this scene in particular, until it gets to a point where they're all kind of talking quite loudly and quite excitedly. And the chorus leader of the slave women looks over to, to the siblings and basically says to them, hey, Maybe we should lower the volume a little bit. We're getting really excited. We're getting really rowdy. People might hear this and they might then hear that Orestes is back. And even worse is that they might then go to the palace and tell them before Orestes can go and surprise them and avenge Agamemnon, right? So that's again, a very summarized version of what's happened. But Orestes turns in this moment to the slave woman leader of the chorus and says to her, don't worry about that, basically. I have no doubt that that will not happen, even if we're yelling and we're shouting, because the only reason why I'm here is that the god Apollo's oracle told me that I had to do this, meaning that the god Apollo is on my side. However, Orestes does say that even if the oracle didn't necessarily verbatim tell him, that simply the way of the world would have made him come back. And also the way of the world is going to mean that he is successful. The reason why I am using this around the way of the world 
is not because it is a direct quote, but instead because this was expected of ancient sons, that they are going to avenge their fathers, right? So this is more so divine law rather than human law. So Orestes has total confidence that because this is the way of their world, that no matter what happens, he will go back and he will avenge his father and he will be successful in doing so. Now there is a very long conversation between the chorus leader, uh, Orestes and Electra, and it's mostly them sort of standing around, pouring out libations, calling up to the gods, and Orestes basically saying that he wishes Agamemnon had not come home, that he had died instead at Troy. Electra's like, oh my god, no, I'm so happy he didn't die at Troy because then he could come home. As you can see, it's not really that important to the plot. But basically, they stand around and they argue for a little bit. But eventually, as they're doing all of these libations, the chorus and the chorus leader go to the back of the stage, which leave Orestes and Electra, the siblings, finally sometime, Pylades isn't there either, but they finally have some time to just kind of talk and to call up to their father. And they ask their father Agamemnon to look down on them and to watch over them as they do this. They ask Agamemnon to give them strength in order to enact this deed. And also further than that, they remind the ghost of their father that the two of them are all he has on earth. Now, when all of this is done, Orestes turns to the chorus leader and to Electra because the chorus and the chorus leader sort of move forward again. And he turns to them and he says, this is kind of weird. Why did you guys decide to come to the tomb today? Like the one day that we are now down here, we're paying our respects, we've come back to Mycenae. What drove you in here? And the chorus leader says, funny you should ask, Actually, what happened last night was that Clytemnestra, Queen Clytemnestra, she had this crazy nightmare where she gave birth to a snake and then when she swaddled the snake and brought it up to her breast, it was one, horrible to look at, and two, it was absolutely terrifying and it bit on her breast and it really hurt her and it drew blood. And so that was like a really bad omen to Clytemnestra. And so she asked us to come down and to make offerings in order for the nightmares to go away. Now hearing this, Orestes is super ecstatic about it, right? He hears this and he goes, well, clearly I'm the snake. So this is amazing. He immediately takes charge and he starts to tell us how he is going to kill his mother. So he comes up with this plan and he tells the chorus leader, the rest of the chorus and Electra to go back to the palace and not say a word, basically. And Orestes and Pylades will disguise themselves as travelers from Parnassus. They will speak Parnassian, which is a different dialect of, a slightly different dialect of Greek at the time. The different language will allow them to go undetected. And when they get to the palace, they will ask for refuge as travelers. Once they are allowed in, they will then take their chance and Orestes will kill Aegisthus first and then Clytemnestra. And that is his big plan. Now Orestes, Electra and Pylades leave the stage, but the chorus is left on stage because the scene has to change, right? So the scene changes to the outside of the palace, but as this is happening, we have the chorus who is singing this ode of terrifying ladies of Greek myth. Now there are a number of them that in general, you might not know who they are. I do have them written down, but even looking at the list, I don't wanna confuse anybody. But one of the various people who is mentioned, uh, if you guys, oh, I have done an episode on her. I did an episode on Hypsipyle. And she is the queen of Lemnos. We'll hear about her in a different book, which I will be going into. But the uh, chorus do mention the ladies of Lemnos and the ladies of Lemnos are people who basically killed all of the men that live on the island. It is a myth from Greek myth. It is an actual real thing that is written in ancient sources. Um, but they do sing of, of her and of Hypsipyle and of uh, these people and then of other famous mythological characters. But there are lots to list off, which I'm just, we're gonna be here all day. So I'm not going to. Anyways though, the chorus finished this ode by saying that Orestes is brought home by Fury, but by his also like divine right. And when they finish off the scene, we then cut to Orestes and Pylades who are approaching the gates of the palace. Orestes and Pylades, they actually stand outside the palace and they knock three times. Remember they are dressed as travelers. Okay, so they're just dressed as like these random travelers that are gonna go in. And so no attention really needs to be brought to them, but Orestes gets a little bit antsy. And so on the fourth try, he gets up to the gates and he's like, hello, I've knocked three times. Where is somebody? Is anyone home? Finally, a guy comes out and the guy is like, yeah, 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 I hear you. What is it that you want? And Orestes replies to this guy and he says that he has come with news for the masters of the house. So out comes Clytemnestra and Clytemnestra is like, hello, kind strangers. Like you have traveled clearly from far. You guys have a little different dialect to us. So if you would like to come in, stay in the palace and all of this sort of stuff, you are absolutely welcome. Basically she offers very, very good hospitality. We spoke a lot about this in my Odyssey episodes. Clytemnestra does a great job of offering hospitality, 
But Orestes initially, remember Orestes in disguise, is like, you might want to hear my news first before saying that we can come in. He explains that he and his traveler friend, that is not a direct quote, I'm just reminding you that again, this is not true, but he says that they are from near Delphi and they were on their way down to Argos when they came into contact with someone that told him, well, since you guys are going all the way to Mycenae, can you tell them that their son Orestes is dead? So Orestes in disguise relays this to Clytemnestra and basically says, that guy has asked me to go back and to tell him whatever you want us to do with the body. Do you want us to bring it back? Do you want us to bury it over there? Did you want to come and get it yourself? You know, whatever it is. And obviously hearing this news, Clytemnestra as a mother is completely, completely distraught. Now, I do want to just interject here. Is Clytemnestra distraught because Orestes has died? Probably, right? Okay, so she just lost Iphigenia just, I mean like, what, like 12 years ago, 13 years ago at this point? So she lost Iphigenia, which was obviously traumatic, so traumatic that she wants to murder her husband. She then pretty much is not all that close with Electra. So she really was counting on Orestes to come home. Now she has this news that Orestes isn't coming back. Is that the reason why she's upset? Or is she just faking it? Because actually secretly she's happy because, well, Orestes is not gonna come back and avenge me and avenge just this in order to then you know make sure that agamemnon's name lives on and the family is honored so he's not going to come back and kill us which is actually really great which one is it is clytemnestra faking it is clytemnestra honestly really sad about this you guys can let me know in the comments i have heard both arguments from actual professors i've heard both arguments from people who've performed this in the theater and the different ways that they play it i've heard both arguments from academics all over the place but i'm curious for you guys do you think that clytemnestra hearing that Orestes is dead, is she sad that Orestes is dead or is she just covering up the fact that she is secretly relieved she doesn't have to worry about him coming and killing her? Let me know in the comments below. But back to the action, Clytemnestra says to the boys that, you know, this is obviously terrible news. However, her offer of hospitality does stand. So if they would like to come in, they are more than welcome and they can sleep there for the night before they go on their long journey back to basically where they came from. She doesn't say that, but she says, before you embark on your longer journey tomorrow, you can obviously stay. So Orestes takes her up on this offer. Obviously, we know that Orestes is going to say yes. And so Clytemnestra, when she came out, by the way, Electra was behind her. And so she has Electra sort of bring them in and Clytemnestra goes back into the palace with all of them. So that Orestes and Pylades, Orestes and Pylades in disguise, can be led to their quarters. Left on stage again is the chorus. And the chorus basically come out and they say, now's the time, guys, she's gonna die. And as they're saying this, actually a nurse comes on stage and she actually raised Orestes. So she has just come on stage after hearing this bad news. And the chorus are like, what's wrong? And she says, this is like the worst thing that could have happened, that we have, you know, all this death that has happened around us. I raised this boy. You know, I really, really loved him like my own son and to hear that he's dead has just crushed me. And in fact, she is so upset that she actually blames Aegisthus for this and she calls Aegisthus the ruination of this house. Hearing this, the chorus is like, just, just wait. Obviously, when the nurse who is completely distressed hears that the chorus is not completely distressed, she kind of turns to them and she's like, how in the world can you be so happy to hear that Prince Orestes is dead? To which the chorus reply, technically only the messengers said that Orestes is dead. And with that thought, the nurse walks off stage and leaves the chorus on stage to continue singing yet another choral song. As they're singing about Orestes and hoping that he has you know, this great success in carrying out these murders for him to remember that he is his father's son. Aegisthus now walks on stage. And as soon as he walks on stage, the chorus call him a butcher, which is dark, but also he's kind of like an indirect butcher. I think this is what they mean because again, Aegisthus, as we heard in the last play, he does not actually deliver the blows that kill Agamemnon, nor does he deliver the blow that kills Cassandra. However, his presence, in the same way that the nurse says that Aegisthus is the ruination of the house, his presence in the palace, you know, sort of him coming in, kind of pushed Clytemnestra as well over the edge to actually do this. That's at least sort of the logic that's going on here, right? It's all Aegisthus' fault, just to clarify that. Aegisthus, though, does not come on stage just to sort of dance around, that in fact he comes on and he asks the chorus what the news really is from the strangers because he knows, he's heard through the grapevine of all the people in the palace, that the strangers say that Orestes is dead. 
but if there's anything else that they know that the you know strangers have brought to the home and any more news that they have brought of Orestes or of you know any literally anything else the chorus reply and say that they don't know anything else they've only heard rumors much like a just this so what he should do is actually go and see the strangers for himself and ask the strangers directly. Aegisthus agrees and he says that he's only going to go in to actually go and meet the strangers not because he wants to hear any more information but because he wants to suss out who the strangers are. Then in fact he specifically says for all I know I'm going to go in there and they are going to be Orestes himself. And despite that omen, despite him literally saying what the whole crowd is sitting on the edge of their seat, the audience watching this are going, yeah, that's exactly what this is, Aegisthus still goes into the palace. As the chorus is singing, much like in the play The Agamemnon, throughout their song we hear a scream from inside the palace, and the chorus of female slaves do the exact same thing, where they hush each other and they say, listen, something's happening in the palace. They don't do the whole panto thing that we saw in the Agamemnon, which is like, oh my god, a scream, and ah, I'm dead, I'm not. we don't hear any of that. But there is a scream, they do get hushed, and they do listen to what's going on. But before they can get confirmation, because Aegisthus doesn't scream anything like, I'm dying, I've been stabbed, oh no! But one of Aegisthus's, who now is wounded, one of his servants comes out onto stage to deliver the news. Because again, as I explained in the Agamemnon, you cannot have this action happen on stage in the ancient plays, for various reasons, you know, there aren't enough actors, uh, also how are they gonna do that without any special effects, that was also not customary in ancient times, so all of that kind of action has to happen off stage, and then somebody delivers it on stage, so now we have this wounded servant who comes on. The wounded servant announces that Aegisthus has been killed, so now we're all up to date, and as he tries to walk off stage, the chorus are basically like, hold up one sec, Clytemnestra's next. And right on cue, speak of the devil, Clytemnestra shows up on stage. When she walks on, she basically says, what the hell is all the ruckus about? What is going on? And the servant says to Clytemnestra, the dead are cutting down the quick. That is an exact quote, just so that you guys know. Because as soon as the servant says that, Clytemnestra replies and says, Oh goody, a riddle. I love riddles. It's just one of these things. Again, I know it's a tragedy. I know that's supposed to be taken very seriously. But it is quite funny, we have to admit, that in amongst literally death and dying, Clytemnestra is then like, Oh, give me another clue. Like, what? Anywho, there is a back and forth between her and the servant, and Clytemnestra eventually figures out what has actually gone down. When she puts two and two together, she asks the servant to go and fetch her an axe so that that way she can protect herself against Orestes. Much like in the Agamemnon, as soon as the servant leaves, the doors behind us at the back of the stage open up to reveal not only Orestes who is standing there much like his mother did at the end of the Agamemnon, holding a terrible weapon, but we reveal the body of Aegisthus who is now dead. But unlike in the Agamemnon, Orestes isn't done yet. And in fact, he sees his mother, he turns to her and he says, it's you I want. And as he starts stalking towards his mother and he's really got this villainous glare in his eyes, he's going to kill his mother, he's killed the boyfriend, you know, and so now he's going after the woman that actually murdered his father. And Clytemnestra starts to panic, right? Understandably. And what she goes into, into this mode of like, I need to protect myself. I need to make sure that Orestes doesn't kill me. He is my son. Remember, she just thought that he was dead. Now he's alive and he's stalking towards her murderously, okay? So she decides that her fallback is going to be to remind him that she is his mother. Just so that you guys know, as Orestes is approaching his mother, they are actually having a back and forth, which is, is actually very uncomfortable because you have... Clytemnestra, who's very distracted by Aegisthus' dead body, and as she's sort of saying, you know, I love this man, and how could he be dead, and this is horrible, Orestes is basically yelling at her, saying, how could you love this man when the man you should have loved was my father? Like, he is really defending Agamemnon, he is really his father's son. But either way, they are having this back and forth, this back and forth. And finally, Orestes gets to Clytemnestra. When he gets to her, he pulls her towards the body of Aegisthus, and as he's doing that, Clytemnestra, that's when she starts saying, remember that I am your mother. Remember that I am the person who birthed you. I gave you life. You know, I fed you from my body. You know, all of this sort of stuff. She's reminding him being like, I'm your mother. Like I'm a person that has been there for you since day one. I grew you in my belly, the whole shebang. She's pulling out all the stops to try and save her life against her son. 
And actually it's in this moment that Orestes kind of pulls back, not physically, but he has a moment where he doesn't know if he can actually do this. When she's talking about how she is his mother, he has a moment of questioning. He says, can I actually kill my own parent? Can I kill my mother? Can I do this? And it's Pylades who he speaks to and who he's sort of bouncing his idea off of saying, I, d I don't know if this is something that I can actually go forward and do. It's Pylades that really pushes Orestes forward and says that he is enacting divine law, that he is doing what is right. He shouldn't hesitate. This is exactly what he is here for. It is what the fates, it is what the gods would have wanted. It's what the, the Oracle wanted of him. So he should be confident in his decision to do this act. Orestes basically says, actually, you're right. So he turns back all murderous towards his mother and he's like, you, I'm gonna kill you. And Clytemnestra's like, I'm your mother. And Orestes is like, no, you're a murderer. And Clytemnestra's like, hey, remember again, I birthed you. Like she is really just reiterating this over and over and over again. It's a very, very strong argument, I have to say. And long story short, Clytemnestra ends up telling Orestes that she had this nightmare and that he is clearly the snake that in her nightmare was coming back and now it's Orestes coming to kill her. And on that note, Orestes drags his mother over the threshold of the house, the doors close behind them, and so we know what's happening back there, but it leaves the chorus on stage alone. The chorus sing of Orestes' triumph, they are saying how great he's done, but they are saying that this act is also going to bring the Furies onto the house, uh, the Furies are these goddesses of vengeance, and so they say that they do, or they will have to, stand by the house and watch for when the Furies do show up. And on that note, the palace doors open, we see Orestes who is standing there with his bloody sword, Pylades who is with them because he went with them, by the way, when they all went off stage, he also went. Uh, so now they are both standing there, Orestes with his bloody sword, and the body of Clytemnestra is next to him. So this image is exactly the same as the one that we saw in the Agamemnon, where Clytemnestra was standing next to Agamemnon and Cassandra, and now we have Orestes who is standing next to his mother, and adjust this. Now the first thing that Orestes does though when those doors open and it's his time to speak is he clarifies why he has done what he has done. Okay, so the first thing he does is say, this is divine order, this is a son's job, this is what I was supposed to do. In fact, he doubles down more than once in this speech about his actions. So we know he's nervous, okay, because he's saying, I did this for a good cause, I did this for a good cause. And it's almost as if he's trying to convince himself he did the right thing. To which the chorus do actually reply to him. And again, they do say, you're not wrong. Don't worry, Orestes, what you did was the right thing. But if you think there's trouble now, Trouble is still to come. This does not comfort Orestes. And in fact, Orestes says, well, it had to be the right thing to do, even if there is trouble to come, because he had said that when he went to go and speak to the Oracle, and when Apollo gets involved in this whole thing, he said that there was a punishment that was told to him that he could not repeat if he was not going to do this act. So that would have been worse. That really what we hear is that Orestes was picking between a rock and a hard place essentially, and he chose to go with this option because that way he wouldn't have to endure the awful punishment that the Oracle and that Apollo promised if he didn't do this. And as he's talking, he's still holding the weapon, right? But in his other hand, Pylades gives him this olive branch. And when he goes down and he's like, oh, look at this, look at this olive branch, how nice. He can't help but stare also at the hand that is covered in the blood of his mother. This is like a full on Lady Macbeth moment where Orestes is totally just freaking out looking at this, being like, the blood of my mother is on my hands. The blood of my mother is on my hand. Except unlike Lady Macbeth, there is literally blood on his hand. Whereas Lady Macbeth was like, there, the blood. Anyways, this is not about Lady Macbeth. Again, the chorus hearing this try to assure Orestes and they say that actually what he has done has saved all of them. He saved the rest of Argos from being ruled by these two horrible people. So not only is he avenged his father, which is what he should do, but the chorus then lay into that and they also say, yes, that and, which is by the way, an improv technique in case anybody wants to know, it's yes and, that's exactly what the chorus are doing right now. <laughs> They're saying yes, and also you're saving the rest of the land from these two horrible people by killing them. So do not feel guilty. But Orestes can't actually reply, right? Orestes, he's now standing there and he's actually looking off stage. He's distracted as to what's going on behind the chorus. And when he starts to speak, we start to realize that the Furies have made themselves visible to Orestes. So he first of all starts off by saying that there are women and he says that they look like Gorgons and that they're there to torment him. And in fact, the speech goes on and on and more in depth. And he starts getting tormented by the sound of these screams, by these Furies, these goddesses of vengeance 
that are absolutely not okay with the idea that this guy has killed his mother because matricide is a huge no-no in the ancient world, okay? The chorus even claim at one point that they can't see the Furies. And that's how, as the audience, we know Orestes is, he's fucking feeling it because if these are that real to him and yet nobody else can see them, it's pretty cool commentary, actually. It's pretty cool commentary on sort of like the demons and the stress and the guilt. But in mythology, just so you guys know, the, the Furies are definitely real. They're like real beings. And so Orestes seeing them, he runs off stage screaming. And following him closely behind is his friend Pylades. And the actual end of the play comes with the chorus, where the chorus gather in front of the audience, and they don't leave us in an uplifting way, let me tell you. They end the play by saying, when the hell is this gonna end? When is this retribution and when is this curse going to end? This murderous fate, this fury. And that is the end of the libation bearers. <laughs> I definitely shouldn't be laughing. Um, I'm just sort of laughing because I just realized that my tone was completely different between me going ta-da and me ending it by saying the murder. But anyways, we've come to the end of the libation bearers. And I want to remind you guys again, as I do with all of these summaries, I miss out a lot of detail. My goal is to make these hopefully entertaining and summaries. So obviously not repeating every single line. And so the thing that I want to leave you guys with is just a reminder to always, always go and read the text. These videos are absolutely not substitutes for reading the text and for engaging with the text. I hope that these are there in case, you know, maybe you're reading the text and you're lost, or possibly you have read the text previously, but you're studying for an exam and you'd much rather just watch this um, then go back and read it again. You know, that's okay, but don't use these as substitutes because this is absolutely not the same thing as reading the play itself, or reading any text that I summarize. And I always wanna leave on that note, and I wanna remind you guys that the ancient texts are beautiful and you should absolutely be reading these um, at the same time as these videos, if not before or after. But thank you guys so much for watching. Thank you guys so much for supporting the channel, for supporting me, for hitting the subscribe button and for engaging with all the content. I appreciate it a lot and we'll be seeing you next time with more videos here on Moan Inc. So I'll see you guys then.